I've never watched the original ATLA, in fact my only experience with it is from the awful movie that bored me to sleep and random episodes of The Legend of Korra that I believe is its sequel series. So I'm going into this blind with no preconceived notions of what it should be and all attempts to judge it off of its own merits instead. So let's answer the question of did Netflix's ATLA star well? Well, the episode begins with a guy getting chased throughout a village as fire is provided with light and he carries what appears to be a scroll, probably hinting that he stole it from those that pursue him, we get a glimpse of this world with these weird animal things and this moment here, when those that are after him use some sort of what appears to be fire magic as he utilizes the very ground they walk on, incapacitating them as they call him an earthbender, which given they use flames, that line means they are most likely considered firebenders themselves. Him using the earth to run on shows a way it can be utilized for exploration since he could traverse large gaps or climb large things by utilizing the earth to his advantage. He rushes towards what appears to be a friend, holding a mount for him as he gets busted in the back and drops the scroll. Turning around, he faces his pursuers. He brings the ground to float in front of him and sends it flying, taking the men out. This sets up some stakes, now that he's been hit, showing that he's able to be harmed. It also showcases a new use for his power, with the ability to separate the earth from the ground and use it as a flying projectile. Hearing others in the distance, he uses the earth to send the scroll flying into the possession of his ally, telling him to give it to the earth king before raising a wall between them. As noble as his sacrifice appears to be, I can't wrap my head around why he didn't raise the wall with him on the other side and at least attempt to escape as well. Especially since he made it that far on foot, it's logical to assume he could travel faster when riding. That being said, after putting up a decent fight with decent choreography, he gets captured. Raising the established stakes since our main character at this time was an invincible regardless of his power. There's a good transition here where we see him talking to who we can assume based on the terminology used when speaking about the Earth King to be the Fire King himself. FK tells him that he wanted the information to get out for the nations to respond how he knows that they will, and that this was all part of his plan. This establishes him to be a clever man, manipulative and cunning, with full control. Him bringing up air and water cultures as well establishes two other ways of life, ways of fighting, giving us something to look forward to in the future. Adding to the stakes as well as his characterization, he kills the earthbender within moments with only one hand, showing him to be a merciless powerhouse in his own right and a force to be reckoned with. Another man tells him the earthbenders are a threat, with FK saying one among them is, and since they haven't chosen who he calls the Avatar yet, they have to kill them all so no one can become one. It's cold logic but logical nonetheless, showing the lengths the man is willing to go through, the genocide he's willing to enact to get what he wants. A simple yet effective way to establish a clear precedent of stakes and the menace of your villains, as long as their actions in the future mirror what he says in the present. Now we learn of the four nations, water, earth, fire, and air, as well as who the Avatar is, a master of all four elements and whenever one dies, another is born from their spirit so there is always an Avatar. Avatar. Since the last Avatar died, the Fire King called Lord Sozin is wanting to kill off the new one before they can be reborn. But if they always get reborn, wouldn't that just cause another to be reborn soon after? The logic doesn't add up since the show specifically states that the cycle is eternal, which means it's forever. Killing every airbender shouldn't affect that. It doesn't even state that the Avatar has to be an airbender, just that the next one is an airbender. But how do they know that? I'm all sorts of confused, but hopefully I figure it out as the episode goes on. Now we see a boy named Aang being caught. He flies down and establishes himself to have that ability. He's caught a show off, told that he skipped training, to which he retorts that it's the same stuff that he already knows, establishing some more powers, more capability that we may see in the future. The man states that he still has much to learn, although he is more advanced than the others, and that there may come a day where he wishes he spent more time with his teachers. This is foreshadowing most likely due to the extermination campaign from Lord Sozin as a way to establish that although Aang is powerful, he isn't perfect. Given us a chance to see him develop his abilities as the series goes on. They are setting up for the Great Comet Festival, where people called air nomads are arriving, riding on the back of these flying bison creatures. A man talks to the old man, asking ominously if he told Aang something, and that it's urgent that he does, so then they leave to speak to a council. This is foreshadowing as well as the advanced abilities line from earlier that Aang is to be the Avatar. We get more lines of Aang's power with him having the markings of a master, which I will assume to be the arrow on his head. We learn his age. 12. One man on the council, the one that went and got the old man earlier, brings up how Fire Lord Sozin is planning to attack the Earth Kingdom and that the Water Tribe already sent backup, so the air needs the help as well, which they need the Avatar for. Old Man says that although Aang is powerful, he has much to learn, especially about who he is as a person. That if they send him off without instilling values in him, then he may not live up to be the person he is needed to be, which is a fair point. Since the Avatar is built up to be the only force that the Fire Lord fears, possibly the only person 
strong enough to defeat him. Another man says the role of Avatar is a big responsibility, too big for a child, but nobody chose who was to bear that responsibility, which is also a fair point, especially since people before Aang have bared it for lifetimes. We also learn the old man's name, Gyatso, as the man talking feels he's grown too close to Aang and that his feelings are clouding his judgment, which is another point that isn't easy to argue against so Gyatso wisely doesn't attempt to. The council rules to send Aang to learn to bend the other elements, hoping that it's not too late. Since Aang said earlier that he already knows what is being taught to him in terms of airbending, this was the only intelligent next course of action, so I'm glad they established that before this conversation. A nice nod to continuity in terms of dialogue. Aang and Gyatso have some banter between them, establishing them to be comfortable among each other, showing the bond they share as we learn some lore of the world, as the Great Comet Festival only happens once every 100 years. They talk about when Aang received his markings, that most get them in a different place, but that Gyatso wanted them done in the presence of Yangchen, the last air nomad to be Avatar. Here we get more insight of how the Eternal Cycle went, since after her death came Kuruk of the Water Tribe, then Kiyoshi of the Earth Kingdom, and Roku from the Fire Nation, so the next Avatar would be an airbender. Now let's take a look back at my question from earlier. Does this answer it? No. No it doesn't. It just adds more information to it. Now if the Fire Nation kill all the airbenders, that would bring it back to the Water Nation to have the Avatar. It wouldn't eliminate the Avatar in its entirety. I guess they wouldn't have any training though if I understand this correctly, so I guess his plan will work by the end if he just wants to keep the Avatar weakened, but what if someone trains the Avatar behind the scenes? It's just kinda goofy in concept, but with an eternal problem it's not possible to find an eternal solution I suppose, which helps me not dwell on it too much. Back to the episode, he then tells Aang that he is Avatar and tells him about the Fire Nation's plans, telling him that he needs to learn to master all elements and save the world as only he can. He gives them a pep talk about his responsibility and that him not wanting the power is why he's the perfect person to have it. They say they will always be friends, exchange hugs, comforting each other. Aang can't sleep so he goes to sit on a rock, meeting with one of them flying bison things named Appa. Aang confides in Appa about everything Godso said, saying he's a kid, not a hero, but given this happens right after the explanation, it hurts the pacing and feels unnecessary. We already know he doesn't want the responsibility, him telling Appa what was already established and not using any other terminology to further the point home is a sweet scene but that's about it. The only new thing we learn is that he's afraid of his responsibility instead of just not wanting it, which makes sense since he's a kid. He flies off on Appa to clear his head as the Fire Nation approach the village, vowing no survivors. They use their flames to fly, which is a good way to explain why the Earthbender didn't make the wall and then run, but doesn't make sense for the chase scene if all of them can fly since none of them use that ability in order to cut him off or try and circumvent whenever he raised the ground. A small point, but when your show is story heavy, every action does matter since it all affects continuity. The Fire Nation begin their assault in a really awesome scene, with good choreography as well as some solid CG. We see that the airbenders can use air to send their enemies flying, disperse attacks, and even cause tornadoes, using their weapons to cause wind in order to make their attacks more powerful. The Fire Nation are far more brutish with their attacks, overwhelming their enemies with flames, burning everything down around them. Gyatso takes the kids to a corner to try and hide them, which makes me wonder why they wouldn't have an area for those that can't defend themselves, regardless of if the peace was established for so many years. It just feels like a big oversight that any powerful nation should have. While the battle takes place, the A-team is stuck in a storm, swept away in a wave. Gyatso puts up one heck of a fight to save the kids, but the Fire Lord prevails, saying it was due to the power of a comet, which was a surprising scene of respect from the man that just committed genocide, killing the kids off screen as Aang floats to the bottom of the river and uses some sort of power to keep himself alive. It seems like an automatic survival instinct, but I can't say for sure. Hopefully he saves Appa as well. We then see a girl trying to bend water, barely able to move it before eventually giving up. She leaves the cave and we see a snowy village called Wolf Cove. I like this introduction. It feels important, wondrous, and uplifting after the tragedy we just saw take place. Also, I really love the costume design here. Their heavy winter wear looks like exactly what they would need in this weather. Just wish more people wore their hoods up and that they didn't look so pristine, but that's just personal preference. A guy says they've been manning the wall in three hour shifts, but since they can't be trusted to stay at their post, they are now to use the buddy system, even if that means twice the work they had before, since there's now twice as many shifts. When the kids moan and groan, he asks if they have a problem, where none of them do, showing him to be respected by them to some degree, and for him to have some authority over them as well. He and the girl go for a walk, where he reveals that the fishing boats came back empty, and says it proves that if you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself, showing an ego on him that he may grow from in the future. We also learn the girl's name, Katara. The two go fishing, where Katara gets goaded for trying to waterbend due to the threat of the Fire Nation, a nation that hasn't approached a village in years. The way they speak about them makes me think 
think that the Fire Nation has already won the war, or at least won against the Water Tribe, but I can't say for sure. The two start bickering about their priorities, with her caring about waterbending since it built their culture, but him focusing on preparing for battle due to the threat of the war going on. I can see both of their perspectives, and although the dialogue is iffy, I like that it built them up as both caring in their own ways. Katara brings up their father, with the boy saying that he's there instead of him, possibly hinting at their dad's death while establishing the relationship between them, brother and sister. The boat then gets pulled in like magnetism the metal, so we learn the boy's name, Sokka. They crash, getting thrown off the boat as Katara looks up at a weird ice formation in the area that they were drawn to, possibly made by Yang to keep him alive with the power we saw a glimpse of earlier. A boat is on the water, seemingly headed in their direction, with it possibly being associated with the Fire Nation, given the smoke coming out of it in the line earlier from Sokka foreshadowing their arrival. As the boat gets closer and Katara tries to waterbend, the ice formation behind them starts to glow along with some statues on the boat. The formation explodes with a beam of light blasting out of it as the boatman says, finally, showing the importance of what we just witnessed, something he has been waiting for, building a mystery of what it could be. Given the glowing Aang did when in the water earlier, and how he affected said water, it was probably foreshadowing him to be the cause of this moment here. Sok and Katara look up, seeing him stand before them, but sadly no Appa happens to be present. Aang falls to the ground before them, with his energy possibly used up by the power that made the formation, but what that may mean I'm not entirely sure. Sokka and Katara debate on taking Aang, with Sokka against it, but agreeing anyway without much pushback. It goes along with his protector of the village characterization, since taking a random stranger there is definitely a risk, but doesn't push it enough for him to come off as heartless. A decent scene all things considered that ends with what could be Appa still in the ice. Back at the village, people are gathered around Aang, commenting on his appearance and their lack of knowledge regarding his markings. Strange that they never would have seen it given the amount of airbenders that had it, makes me think this village isn't the main water tribe themselves, but a clan that has stemmed from them. Either that or Aang has been under ice for so long that people have lived lives where airbenders don't exist anymore. An old woman inspects his body, seeing arrows on his head, and saying that he is an airbender, as Sokka says they no longer exist. So this has to be some time after the airbenders were exterminated, just not sure how long it's been. Leaving it a mystery in a way that doesn't harm the plot at hand, but adds to the world building, again, I like it. The boat boy tells who appears to be an advisor of some kind like we saw at the beginning, that he thinks the avatar is at the water village, but the man downplays what he says regarding the beam of light, saying it could be nothing more than a celestial glimmer in the sky. This downplaying of the importance of fighting the avatar is rather stupid. It could be indicative of the time past, causing people to believe the avatar died in the invasion, but since his rebirth is eternal, it's dumb to just ignore something off of a mere possibility, especially since it's just as possible to be the outcome he refused to believe. Makes the advisor guy seem like an idiot, and really hurts his characterization thus far. We learn that Boat Boy, whose name is Prince Zuko, has been banished by his father until he finds the Avatar and that three years have passed, finally giving us a possible time frame since the murders took place, since Aang became a block of ice in the ocean, but definitely giving us an amount of time from when Zuko began his hunt for the Avatar. The advisor guy says it's hard to see him get his hopes up every time he sees a sign, showing that this isn't the first time he's done this, and answering the question of why the advisor is skeptical, even though again, his job is to find the Avatar, the one being that can bring peace to the land that his father fears, no sign should be avoided. Zuko brings up being the heir to the throne, the advisor says it's not everything, and Zuko fires back that it may not have been for him, adding mystery to the life that the advisor has lived, and what association he's had with the throne in the past, beyond acting as a sort of advisor to the next to be on it. Zuko says the throne is his destiny, and we cut back to Aang dreaming of the day he went into water and jolting awake. He walks outside and runs, seeing kids playing not affected by any negative side effects, like muscle atrophy from the time he was froze. Sokka separates Aang from the other kids, saying he could be an enemy, showcasing his protective traits that have been talked about all throughout the episode. Aang questions on where he is, calls for Appa with nobody knowing who he's talking about. Aang then flies again as he calls for Appa, proving to everyone that he is an airbender. They should have waited till this moment to show him flying, make it something he has never done before, but an ability he discovers he has due to his emotional response to losing Appa. It would have given the scene some extra emotion that it doesn't have as is. Is, since Appa was only on screen for a few minutes, and Aang's response doesn't elicit any emotion by itself. He questions the village on if they have seen Appa repeating Sky Bison in a way that honestly makes me want to smack him. Sky Bison. Sky 
Guy Bison. Repeating it doesn't help. He comes off as annoying instead of distressed. Not a fan of this scene at all. Thankfully, Appa does come though, so we can finally move on from it. Gran, the old woman from earlier, tells the story of when the Fire Nation attacked Aang, plunged them into a time of darkness, since the Avatar was missing. She tells Aang about the fall of the Air Temple and the extinction of the Airbenders. She says that the comet was last in the sky a hundred years ago, so the three years line from earlier, Zuko being banished to find the Avatar, was just the amount of time since he set out. This is a major revelation. Aang is over a hundred years old, and the war against the Fire Nation has reigned for a hundred years as well. Time flies when you're chilling in the ocean. I remember that for the next time I go to the beach. Zuko is giving the troops a pep talk, nothing new is learned, moving on. Katara finds Aang and asks him if he's okay, he's struggling with the same revelation as me that a hundred years has passed. His reaction is underwhelming though, like dude, cry or something. He has the same composure as he does in every other situation. There's two ways that we can take this. One, he's not reacting because he's around someone else, like how he never showed his fear around God so earlier. It would be a decent way to cement it as his characterization while showing how his actions for who he is is reflected continuity wise. Or they could never touch on his pain because it's based off a kid show. I guess we'll see. She relates to Aang since the firebenders attacked her village and killed a lot of people there. There's some terrible and quick cuts as she says this that mean nothing to me and she says that her dad left for the war right after Anne never came back. Their dad left Sokka in charge, who was 13 at the time, which explains his care for the village and everyone in it, as well as his ego, he's kind of earned it. We learn that the Fire Nation has conquered most of the world, but that the waterbenders are still fighting back, and that the Earth Kingdom still remains strong to the best of their knowledge, showing how disconnected all the nations have become a far cry to the alliance that was building in the beginning. Aang says that he used to have friends in the Fire Nation that he used to visit, but the conversation with the council at the beginning made it seem like he has and never yet left the village, and that's what their problem was with. That's how he was being raised by Gyatso. Plus, air nomads are the travelers, I would think, not kids, but he does have a sky bison, so I guess anything is possible. Zuko gets a montage of his skills practicing to fight the Avatar, basing the Avatar's possible skills off the feats of old Avatars. It helps with lore building as well as the respect a kid like Zuko would have for powerhouses like the Avatar of old. The advisor tries to hint that Zuko was sent on this mission to get rid of him, but he refuses to believe it, holding out hope for who he wants to believe his father is, instead of acknowledging the possibility of who he actually is. Which makes sense, kids want to see the best in their parents, no matter how awful their parents happen to be. Katara takes Aang to our waterbending practice place, and we learn that she's the only waterbender in their tribe left, because the Fire Nation killed them all. Aang tells her a technique he learned for bending itself, that helps her gain better control of her bending as they look outside to see the Fire Nation heading their way. His kindheartedness and ability to control and harness his power were both put on display here. It was sweet, even if it did feel like Katara caught on a little too quickly. She may be more powerful than she seems. They learn that Aang's the Avatar, with Sokka calling him a coward and telling Katara to hide. As someone entrusted with protecting the village since he was 13, seeing Aang as a coward for shirking his responsibilities makes all the sense in the world. It also reflects Aang's very own fears that he doesn't deserve the responsibility. If someone like Sokka was the Avatar, would things have turned out different? Contrasting the two was a good move, and I'm glad they went that route. The Fire Nation soldiers land and approach the village gates. Zuko leading them and saying he has no desire for conflict and just wants the outsider that doesn't belong. Sokka goes to get Aang because village first, but Katara reminds him that their mother taught them to protect those that can't protect themselves, calling the Avatar hope that they need as a reason to keep going. Sokka grabs a weapon and challenges Zuko to a duel, which he agrees to since there's no glory in sending an army in to slaughter them knowing that they'll win. A mindset that's a far departure from Zosin's when he attacked the Air Temple, showing some redeeming qualities in Zuko that I hope see touch showing some redeeming qualities in Zuko that we hopefully see get touched on in the future. Zuko wins, it's not even a contest, but before he can claim the kill, Aang interjects, showing that he isn't a coward because regardless of his fear, he has just accepted his responsibility as the Avatar. He throws the soldiers around, blocks the fire from Zuko, and gives himself up to spare the village. A selfless move, a noble move, showing what it means to truly be a hero. Him willing to fight for the tribe causes them to fight for him. They throw rocks and fire spears, but are unable to do any lasting damage. Aang tells Sokka he's the bravest person he's ever met and that nobody has ever fought for him before going with the Fire Nation. This just completely downplayed the deaths of the entire Air Temple. The whole reason they died was for him, and he knows this because Gran said it earlier. It was a kind line, but definitely should have been tweaked to something else. Saying, you didn't have to fight for me, thank you, it meant the world, would have had the same point without dishonoring the deaths of those that fought for him a hundred years ago. Sokka puts another boy in charge who gets super excited over it, pretty wholesome as he and Katara go after Aang who is now locked in a cell.
well. <clears throat> he is visited from the man I've called an advisor this entire time, revealed to be named Iro, son of Fire Lord Azalon, and questions on why the Fire Nation started the war, to which he gives other people's perspectives. Some that chalk it up to being their nature, to burn and consume. Others say the drive is ultimately for peace, since they believe it would best become real under their rule, and retorts that peace comes from respecting life, not destroying it. As Iro says that peace can come from ending the war, which is what capturing Aang may lead to, since as Katara said earlier, Aang meets hope, and capturing him takes that hope away. Aang wonders if he believes that capturing him will bring about the end of the war. Iroh refuses to answer and leaves, which is an answer in and of itself. Aang uses his airbending to snatch the guard's keys as Sokka and Katara discuss how they will get Aang. Sokka says they can utilize a current and maybe draft off their wake, showing some problem-solving skills and intelligence from him. Katara, on the other hand, thinks riding up is a better idea, something Sokka is against but does anyway. Not only a decent and then the opposite happens joke, but also showing that Sokka would go against what he wants for what he should do, developing his personality through some good humor. Aang escapes his cell and wanders the vessel, finding what appears to be Zuko's room and stealing a book about the avatars that have come before, hoping to either learn something from it or to keep Zuko from having the information himself, while also showing that Zuko has some respect for those who bear the title of Avatar, which was brought up earlier. Aang finds his glider and makes it outside. He sneaks across the ship, getting seen by Zuko, jumping over the edge. The Fire Nation opens well of fire, as Aang skillfully avoids them all showing prowess in the air that was set up with him flying from earlier, but Zuko manages to hit him, showing Zuko's prowess compared to the men that was with him, a good way to contrast their abilities and show him as more of a threat because of it. Aang falls from the sky, not flying because I don't know why. It's proven that he is able to do so, so the fact that he can't now isn't really explained. We can chalk it up to him having to have a certain stance or mindset in order for it to work, but if he saves himself from falling by flying in later scenes, without any training to counteract these points, then this scene was just trying to be tense for the sake of being so, even at the expense of the rest of the show's logic. Once Zang recovers his glider, Sokka grabs his hand, saving his life as he said he was going to do, showing Sokka to be a man of his word, as well as a now established ally since he went out of his comfort zone, his safety net, in order to save Aang's life. Zuko fires fire at them again, but Katara blocks it with her water bending, showing great strides in her abilities, but given how easy it was, it's hard to believe. She was at a high altitude from the water, yet was able to make that much of it rise that far, that quickly. It's a far cry from her barely able to move it in her last scene. It feels cheap and needs to be addressed in some capacity, or stakes are hurt since the characters can conjure up whatever ability they need to in order to save themselves regardless of how out of their depth said ability would be. Aang thanks them for saving him, they say they can't go home, and in response head to the air temple. Aang sees the leftover damage from the battle, destroyed buildings, and damaged armor scattered about. It's also not had any upkeep all that time, so moss and greens are growing around, signifying such. Aang finds the body of Gatso, remembering what he said to him regarding him being the avatar, and getting emotional from it all. His emotions lead to him unleashing power, destroying everything around him, and putting his friends in danger in the process. It shows the overwhelming power he is capable of, even right now, and sets a precedent of how equally overwhelming emotions would affect him. Plus, although short-lived, his bond to Gatsu was shown rather well, and this response cements how close the two truly were. Aang said he's lost everything and is alone. Katara tries to cheer him up by saying that when you lose everything is when you learn to fight, and Aang talks about their sacrifices and how it's up to him to ensure that they weren't in vain. Aang says he's going to master all the other elements of bending, showing newfound resolve, as Zuko puts his face onto a board, showing the danger his now-known existence will have him in. Aang ends the episode acknowledging his responsibility and saying that this is just the beginning. So did Netflix's ATLA start out well, although not perfect? Yes, it did. It established the good action scenes we have to look forward to, the capability of death, and the ferocity of the enemy. It's setting up as a kid, not wanting his responsibility at first, but growing to understand the importance of it as the episode goes on. It built Sokka up as a warrior that had to grow into one fast, willing to fight to protect what he believes he should, even if his abilities aren't necessarily as strong as those around him. Katara, even if the performance was a little wooden, is shown to be caring, powerful in the art of waterbending, and willing to stand up for what she believes, even if it goes against the beliefs of those around her. Even if her not having set limitations in regards to her powers do hurt her at the end of the day. Zuko is out to prove himself to his father to defeat the Avatar and has been for quite some time. Now that the existence of the Avatar is not only confirmed, but his identity as well, it will hopefully add newfound drive for him to achieve his goal. Iroh is a wise man who doesn't seem to necessarily agree with the Fire Nation's cause, nor trust the Fire Lord himself. He is skeptical of how Zuko is treated, treats the Avatar with respect, and seems to be more open-minded than the nation 
Anthony hails from, possibly setting up his defection, betrayal, maybe even a coup in the future. Most likely him somehow training Aang in the way of the fire, but I'm not sure how that will work now that they are separated, only time will tell. My throat is on fire, so I think I'm gonna call it here. If you learned anything, subscribe. If you dislike this, then dislike it, and for more news, reviews, and whatever we choose, stay tuned to Nerds Feed. Have a great day. Thank you.